New episode of Show and Go with Taylor Davis. For now, again, we're workshopping some names, but it's still Show and Go with Taylor Davis. We're looking for the sexy rebrand coming into the year. Today, Wednesday, January 24th, we got some interesting one-year deals, minor league deals that we want to talk about, and that will lead to some greater trends in baseball and also some takeaways from the playing days and just kind of greater human truth baseball conversations. You're back in uh you're back in southern Indiana now, aren't you? Oh man, I'm back home. Saw the kids. Man. First time I was away from my kids for two weeks. First time I've been away from both kids uh yeah. for that long, especially. But yeah, no, it's uh yeah, it's great to be back home. <clears throat> um and then yeah, I feel like it's been like a pretty like normal, like this was like a standard off season week in baseball past, right? Yeah. Like this was like Every week you were seeing the two or three non-significant, maybe one significant move, couple minor league deals. And it just feels like in the past three or four years, man, it's like right away there's deals. And then it is slow for a really long time. So we were really lucky in the offseason going into the 2022 season because of that lockout. And I say we're lucky for the lockout, but we were lucky in terms of a conversation thing because we knew when there was going to be nothing happening we knew that for that three month stretch or whatever it was where major league baseball was locked out that we weren't going to get shit so right. we you know pr- called an audible we we went elsewhere for for our conversation starters but all of a sudden it came in a flurry after that lockout was lifted and yeah. it came in a flurry before that lockout went into effect now it's it's your classic timing of hey, you've got big free agent go, then the guy that's maybe behind him on the free agent depth chart also goes because the market's now set for him. And then there's that standstill and we're in one of those standstills. But we we did get a couple one-year deals we get to talk about. Yeah, it, you know, I will say this. And like, as I'm getting ready to say this, one of the guys we're going to talk about is a Boris guy, but it does it is a little interesting that a lot of the, once again, let's go back five years and don't get me wrong. I am a huge Scott Boris fan in a sense of like, I think what he's done for the industry is power the players. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I do think the teams are, are starting to show, um, you know, their displeasure, I guess. Like, I don't know if they're displeased or not, but like, it just does seem like for some reason, if any agent's got a couple guys, it's him. Like that's that's waiting through February to sign. Who's the Boris guy that we're going to talk about? Uh, Paxton. Oh, Paxton. I didn't know Paxton was a Boris guy because I've got Gallo as a Wasserman guy. And then I've got Chapman as an ISC guy. He's he's had three different agents in his baseball yeah, career. Yeah, uh, but you, you also have Paxton as a Boris guy. So. We're going to talk Paxton, Araldis Chapman, and um, Joey Gallo as guys that have signed. Guy that didn't sign, you mentioned, was Adam Adovino. And he had some interesting comments a little bit earlier in the week. I think he opens up a whole can of worms when it comes to declining a player option when you are not necessarily going to get paid big time. Marcus Stroman makes a ton of sense that he declined that option. He was looking for a multi-year deal. He got that multi-year deal. Other guys that declined a player option, I'm thinking, I mean, Bellinger declined it. He a Mutual that turned into a player option so he could go get his bag. And we assume he's going to go get his bag at some point. Adovino was was a different case because he was probably on the fence of opting in or opting out. He opts out and you wonder if this is going to turn into like the Dennis Schroeder thing where he had $80 million on the table and he was like, no, I'm going to go bet on myself. And all of a sudden it it kind of bites him in the ass. A- at what point do you say, okay, I'll take the financial security as opposed to I'm going to take a risk. So the, the statements that he made made it seem like they weren't financially minded. Um, He's 38 and he claims that he did it because how the team scuffled at the end, the moves that they made, the comments they were making made it seem like they weren't sure they were going to compete this year in 24. So he wasn't sure he said, I'm at the end of my career. I want to play somewhere where we're going to try to win. Um, you know, and, and 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 you brought it up, but like the interesting thing to me is is it was a pretty fair, I think it was like six, seven, five, which like it's a pretty fair deal to begin with. Um, you know, I, I, I get it, I guess, but I just think it is so fascinating because 
I'm not sure that he's going to find a job. And if he does, it's going to be much lesser than six, seven, five. I have to assume. Plus he's from New York. Like the whole thing. It's a little interesting. Uh, and he made a comment about talking to David Stearns and how Stearns kept things close to his vest and how he should, but how he did. And so like, that kind of makes me wonder, is there a little, is there some, there's some bad blood there? What do we got? I don't know. I I find the lack of transparency actually understandable from David Stearns' perspective. I don't think that you, especially a first-year GM, like that guy has not been in that chair for a baseball game yet as, as lead exec for the New York Mets, or at least like a full season and a full off-season cycle. So he's still trying to get his feet wet in a place that he's brand new to. I, I totally understand it from that perspective of like, hey, man, I don't want to promise you anything. It's like um, Kyle McCord. You probably know pretty well quarterback at Ohio State. He hit the portal. He's at Syracuse now. I'm over the moon as a Syracuse person. He was obviously not the right person to quarterback Ohio State, right? They go and get you know, the, the kid from K-State. But what I'm getting at what is – else they got, by the way? Do you see what else they got? Uh, Ohio State. Everybody yeah. under the sun. Judkins from Ole Miss is going to be a dog. The other uh, say it, Julian Sayan from Alabama. Sayan, yeah, the five star from from Bama. Obviously, going to be amazing. Like Ryan Day aced the portal after we were like, "This guy can't beat Michigan." What's he doing? He's secured that he's the he's the guy at Ohio State. But the point that I'm getting at is McCord. Less than the report was less than 24 hours after they lost to Michigan. McCord walks into Ryan Day's office. And asks for QB1 reassurance that he's going to be the starter week one next year and an NIL bump. And Ryan Day said no and no. And that's transparency. It's also blunt honesty. And Ohio State got better. McCord got screwed. And listen, man, like you don't perform, you might get screwed. If Ottavino was in a position to sign a two year deal, he's probably not getting screwed and it's probably more transparent. But like he was so on the edge that Stearns, he might've just been being honest and transparent. I don't know what we're going to do just yet. Or, or Stearns knew what Adovino wanted to hear and didn't want to pay Adam Adovino 6.75 million. I think you have to have that as an option, right? Like I'm not saying that happened, but that's gotta be a possibility that like he goes, Hey man, this is a, You know, he wants us to win. I don't know. But I do think they're in an odd spot. I think the Mets are in a weird spot. Um, So I get it. Uh, But anyway, it it is fascinating. Um, You know, I think it's the opposite of of Matt Carpenter. Now, obviously, uh, Ottavino had a little better year than Carpenter did, but Carpenter takes the – didn't even consider not taking the uh, player option. Yeah. So, I don't know. I, I'm reading this quote from Adovino right now, too. It, it, from my perspective, I just didn't feel 100% certain of what direction the team was going to look like come spring training. Do you think that should impact a guy at that stage in his career? Well, he's claiming that's why it impacts him is because he's at that stage in his career. I've got one or two years left. I want to try to win. I get it. I, I get that. I do. I really do. So, so you um, can't get pissed when you're talking to an exec of a team that is still on the edge on if they want to win or not. Well, and and on top of that, like go on top of that, like even if you're not going to win, what were Adam? How how did Adam Ottavino pitch last year? Pull up his numbers right now. Adam Let's... Ottavino last year. This guy. 66 appearances of 3-2 ERA and 61 and two-thirds. Striking out a hitter per inning, walking four and a half. Then, yeah, I mean, yeah, then I, I don't know why. I don't know. Well, then I question more than why somebody hadn't offered him a one-year deal. A guy at 38 giving you 66 innings of a 3-2 with a 30% K rate is pretty impressive. I'm sure you'll get one. I, I'm sure he will get a one-year deal. <laughs> I mean, dude, we can segue this into Chapman, who just got ten and a half mil but after like, three, two, five. But Chapman was striking out forty-one and a third, forty, almost forty-two percent. Yeah, but you're going to tell me that Ottavino's not going to get a major league deal when, like, 
I mean, I'll look at some other relievers that signed major league contracts that were available this off season. I'm just, I'm looking at Ottavino and I'm like, okay, you're better than this guy who just got what a two year deal or whatever it is. Uh, where, where, so where does he go? Where does he go? Where, who, who are you signing? Who are you? That's going to sign Adam Ottavino. I think, I think I'm a flip candidate. Like, I, I think he might be looking at the lower half of Major League Baseball, and it's like, hey, we can flip this guy at the deadline on a one-year deal. That's what Chapman just did. Yeah, but if he's not going to take the six, seven, five from the Mets, why would he take seven from the Pirates? It's tough, man. Like, Brent Suter just signed a one-year deal with Cincinnati. You're telling me that Suter is going to sign one with Cincinnati, and Suter was good last year. I totally get it. And he's a lefty, which adds another wrinkle. He's a lefty, and he eats multiple innings. So, yes. I, I think I think Adam Ottavino needs to be honest with with who he is. And I think that a lot of these veteran relievers need to be honest with who they are at this point. Will Smith signed a one year deal with the Kansas City Royals. Will Smith, three years ago, had the luxury of waiting for the best team to come knocking and give him eight million dollars. Right. But this iteration of Will Smith might not be that guy. Ottavino, yeah, he's coming off of a three two, but he's 38 years old. I know. And the year prior was poor, right? Yeah. Uh, actually, I think it was pretty solid. Oh, were they good? I thought he had a bad year last couple of years. One of the last couple of years. Well, I, I think the narrative around him is like, oh, this guy is horrible with runners on base, right? He's never going to hold anybody. He had a 4-2 in Boston in 2021. But with the Mets the last two years, this guy had a 2-6 ERA in 127 innings. He yeah, was legit. Fantastic. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, like a Ryan Stanek is still sitting on the market. Shelby Miller signed a one-year deal with Detroit. Hector Norris, hey, Shelby Miller had a monster year. Naris wants 50. And with with Chapman getting 10 and a half, I think Naris might get 50. I think Naris might get 50. 50? He wants he wants a three-year $50 million deal. Who gives him that? Dude. I don't know. Somebody. Do I need to make a, a bold prediction right now? Um, well, I think the, the, who's going to spend fifty million dollars on Hector Neris this offseason? I think the Cubs could. If they to don't go with yeah. If they don't re-sign Bellinger, they go get Chapman. Bellinger's a two hundred million dollar price tag at this point. Chapman is probably in a hundred million dollar price tag, maybe one twenty, and they use those savings to go get one of the better setup guys in baseball. Neris is coming off of a year. 68 and a third, a 171 ERA, 10 Ks per nine. No, he's nasty. He's gross. And Rafael Montero got 14 and a half per year. He I got, I, I think, a three year, $45 million dealer, a three year, $45 with like a, with a With a much worse year. Right. So this iteration of the market, obviously, this market is different than two years ago's market or last year's market. Why can't Neris look at Montero and be like, okay, you got to up that a little bit more? I think you can. I just don't know who's going to give him that money. I just don't think we're running out of teams to to dish out money. San Francisco has a ton of funny money. Chicago's just, got some funny money. You're you're not wrong. It just feels like we are, right? It feels like we're close enough to spring training that these teams are like, yeah, we're, you know, peace here or there. Not that we're going to, like, leave these guys on the, you know. But, like, I wouldn't be surprised to see Matt Chapman take a Michael Conforto deal. I would be. I'd be surprised to see Belly take another short deal. Not I'd Matt be Chapman. stunned if Belly took a short term deal. I I agree. But how long are you going to wait if you're Cody Bellinger? Are you willing to wait into May? No, you can't wait into May. I I think we're we're downplaying that we've got three more weeks until pitchers and catchers report. A lot can happen there. And I ask you. From a player standpoint, as somebody that was, you know, at, at certain points in their career going into camp with different teams, when do you need to know? You just I need mean, to I know, think... like, where to go, where to book your flight, right? Because the offseason doesn't change for you. No. it. it and, and look, when you're talking about the kind of money that they're making, it really doesn't change, right? They're doing the exact same things. They're getting prepared the exact same way. Um, there is no fear in any of those guys' minds. Um you know, the only thing you really lack is just game. You know, if, if you show up late to spring, the only thing you should really lack is just um, stamina in the actual game itself. So, you know, I, you know, give a guy Cody, give Cody Bellinger two weeks of seeing live pitching. I think he's fine. Right. We're not mm -hmm. talking about anything crazy. 
Um, I just think it's always strange when guys sign people in the middle of spring training. I don't know. I just feel like the trend the last couple of years, once again, I just feel like, and maybe it was just that one weird year that makes me think it, the year with Kimbrell. Uh, Kimbrel Arietta was in that weird year too, where and he waited. Was Michael there too? Somebody else. Michael might have been in that. Like you know, that's what makes me think about the late guys. And I just, when you're looking at the fits, I agree with you. Like San Francisco and Chicago for both of those, for both of those players, and we're really saying that one because they're big markets, two because they claim they want to win, and three they could actually play there. But. You know, San Francisco's got J.D. Davis if you're going to go sign Matt Chapman. Not that he's better than Matt Chapman, but you've yeah, got somebody. Gonna block him. So you're going to have to move him. Um, I don't know. There's, It's interesting. I'm really interested to see where Bellinger goes. I wouldn't be shocked. Not the Rockies, but like the Rockies signing Chris Bryant. I wouldn't be surprised to see that for Cody Bellinger. If it's just a weird team out of nowhere and they just hundred percent, hundred percent, yeah, I'm I'm gonna put like this like as... the Indians, like the Indians give him a buck eighty, Guardians, yeah, Guardians. <laughs> the Cleveland Guardians give him a buck eighty, or you know something like that, right? Like something where you're just like the freaking Las Vegas Athletics give him two hundred. <laughs> They're not going to promise, but. I, I see what you're saying, and I think that's the bucket that San Francisco finds themselves in, where they have money that they just have to blow on some guys. And the NBA, I think, is is the best example here where they where they have the floor and the cap. They're like, you got to spend your money somewhere. And then that results in Charlotte spending on Bismack Biombo. And it's like, what are we doing here? They had to spend the money. They had to give somebody a $50 million deal, and it turns into somebody getting overpaid. Obviously, baseball doesn't have that problem. There's no floor. I'd say that's not a problem. That's actually a benefit. We could use a floor. But I I do think that San Francisco is going to get a little anxious because Judge was a go and then he was a no-go. And then Correa was a go and then he was a no-go. And apparently they were in the final three for Shohei Otani. And then they were number two for Yoshinobu Yamamoto. How many $300 million guys can you miss out on before you're like, you know what? F it, Cody Bellinger, you're a $200 million man. I think that there's going to be a frustration signing from San Fran at some point. There is a frustration, but like those guys that you mentioned didn't sign there because the offer wasn't there. The offer was there for Otani. They offered and for judge and for Correa. Like all of those offers were there. So those guys aren't not signing with San Francisco because of the money. There's something scaring those guys away from San Francisco. For Yamamoto, it was the sex appeal of the Dodgers. He made that pretty clear. He said, if the Dodgers didn't come calling and they didn't match it, I I would have loved to go to San Francisco. Otani. Second. The what? I thought he said the Mets were a second place. I thought he said the Giants were a second place. Okay. Okay. Could be. Either way. Yeah. Either way, I just know that the the Giants have made a push for and we talked about this on the last episode, but like there is a clear push against signing in, in San Francisco by some of the bigger free agents. And, you know, I remember hearing people talk about before the Cubs redid the locker room. Uh, at Wrigley, I remember people talking about how that was a factor with signing free agents. And that was one of the reasons that they needed to do it was because they couldn't go sign these massive free agents because nobody wanted to be in that locker room at Wrigley Field. Which um, is crazy. And so you go, huh? Which is crazy. It, I mean, it is, it is. But if you look at it like it's your office and you're going to be spending half of your days at that office, you're going to spend a lot of time there. And I haven't, I was never there, um, but I was told that the old locker room was impressively small. Um, But let's go right into James Paxton, man. I, I, <laughs> I want to know your thoughts on that one. I find it to be a fascinating contingency plan for the Dodgers. And I don't know how much of it is a contingency plan as it is, that's the five. Yeah, out of camp. He was paid, what, he, he just got 10 figures, right? He just got, uh, or no, not 10 figures, sorry. He got uh, eight figures. 
right? Ten. He got eight. Impressive. Ten would be awesome. Ten's Otani, uh, Otani numbers, but he he just got an eight figure deal. Like he, it was what one year for eleven million dollars. So I think I just read it. It's one year. Hold on here. I'll read. I'll read you the. Uh, I'll read you the. I got it. Tip eleven tip. plus one opening day roster plus one. There you go. So the base is eleven, and then if he's on the opening day roster, he gets a one million dollar bonus. Which I'm assuming that just means if he's healthy. Uh, I would assume he makes like he makes the rotation out of camp. It's it's a well, fascinating stockpile. What I think this means is Bueller may be delayed. They may have him start later. And it's not a delay from injury thing. I think it's, A, they want him to ramp up at the right time. And I actually kind of like this front layoff. He's ramped up. For 180 innings, assume they, assuming they like get to early November. This is where we had that conversation like three weeks ago, and I said mm-hmm. you're going to limit Walker Bueller. You have to limit Walker Bueller. And you do it on the front end as opposed to midseason a weird shutdown. 100%. Although, here's what I do. This is interesting. I, now, I hadn't actually thought about that point because I, I don't mind that. I wouldn't mind throwing Bueller consistent shorter starts. Hey, you're going to throw a Tony Gonsolin start every every start for the first two and a half months of the year. <laughs> Tony Gonsolin start meaning like normal start for Tony Gonsolin. It's just naturally shorter because he's not a horse. <laughs> yes, he goes four innings. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, here's my first thought. Uh, my first thought in this is just I and I this sounds bad, but like just the Dodgers just absolutely abuse James Paxton as a starter until Kershaw's healthy in the middle of the summer. So could also see that. I could also see them having some doubts about Sheehan. Well, I think you have to. Like I, I think you have to. You know, it's one of those things where like you're expecting to be in the World Series. You're the Los Angeles Dodgers. I don't know that Emmett Sheehan can be a starter in the World Series for you unless unless he he has a uh Brady fought offseason. Brandon fought offseason off or yeah. postseason, I mean postseason. Right. So like you can't assume that he is on your postseason roster. You know what I mean? Yeah, I and I think the baseball world really likes Sheehan because He's got the glitz and glam of a prospect that dominated in the minor leagues and came up for the Dodgers and pitched meaningful games down the stretch. But he had a 4-9 ERA in 60 innings. 60, a 4-9. He was walking four guys per nine. And I'll pull up like just the slash line for opponents against him. But, I mean, there were starts where he looked yeah a little outmatched. A, a 210 batting average against is really impressive. But opponents slugged 4 416 against him. He was walking 11% of hitters. And giving up slug, you can't do that. Right. So the, here's your next option. Do you, uh, do you, if we're going to go with, if we're going to own the like Tony Gonsolin start at a Walker Bueller, I'm going to keep saying that now. Yeah. Um, do we go like a piggyback day with Walker Bueller, James Paxton as one of your starters? You could do that. There are a couple, and, let me just flesh this out real quick. There are a couple options on opening day. You break camp with this rotation. Yamamoto, Bueller, Glasnow, Bobby Miller, James Paxton. Okay. Yamamoto, Glasnow, Miller, Paxton, Sheehan, and Bueller's okay. delayed start. Or all six of those guys, and you have Bueller throw four and Sheehan off of him. So... I think the six makes sense for Yamamoto and you're going to do it next year for Shohei. So if you're going to do it anyway, that's a, I, I hadn't thought about that either. That's a great point. Go six, go six. I hope they go six man. Now they could go let six. Yamamoto. Just let Yamamoto be comfortable yeah. because I think if you don't go six man, you're going to allow Yamamoto to throw on a six day rotation. I could right? see that. Like, as much as I can, I'm going to bump him around so that he can throw on the sixth day. Yeah, that makes sense. And and then you don't have structure for that. I think everybody in this rotation, honest, honest to God, I think everybody in that situation 
benefits from a six man rotation. You don't have a Wheeler in this rotation. Right. You do, you don't have a Lance Lynn or a Kyle Gibson in this rotation. You've got Yamamoto, who's new to this, would probably benefit from a six man rotation. Glass now, who historically has not been able to stay on the field, that guy would love to be on a six man rotation. Bueller, who hasn't thrown in about two years, he would benefit. <laughs> he would benefit from being on a six man. Bobby Miller's in his second year in the league. He would benefit. And Sheehan, like, of course he would benefit. So I think six makes a lot of sense. If you want to do five and you naturally piggyback two of them, okay. Um, But man, interesting. Before we get into Chapman, a couple of Hall of Fame, uh, a couple of Hall of Fame announcements. Todd Helton got in. That's awesome. Love that. And Joe Maurer is a first ballot Hall of Famer. What about Adrian Beltre? Uh, we haven't heard yet. They're being announced right now. But those two, Joe Maurer, Joe Maurer should have been a first bout Hall of Famer. Um, does he go down as the greatest athlete in the history of Minnesota? In the history of Minnesota? Because he's from Minnesota, right? Uh, yeah, he is from Minnesota. I'm thinking like Minnesota professional sports, like Dude, Fran Tarkenton, I, I guess. <laughs> but I'm saying like he was a number one football, basketball, baseball recruit. Yeah was the number one overall baseball pick, now a first ballot Hall of Famer. So I saw a video from maybe it was this year, maybe it was the year before. I, I saw a video of the Twins having the only guy that struck out Joe Maurer. It, I think it was his senior year of high school. He struck out one time. And they had that guy come throw a ceremonial first pitch. He, he struck out one time in high school. In high school. The one guy that struck him out in high school, they had come out and, and throw a ceremonial first pitch. That's awesome. Hilarious. That's tight. But, dude, yeah, I probably. Todd Helton, is he a first ballot to you? Or uh, not he was ballot? not. He was not. Helton, I think, was fifth or sixth year. Is he in there for you, though? Is he a Hall of Famer for me? Yes. Yeah. I think, I think if one guy is supposed to get in, from that Coors bump, it's Helton. Over Walker? I think so. I think both those guys are Hall of Famers. It's it's just so hard for me to say, no, you're not a Hall of Famer because you played at that place. I know. Now, I don't agree with it. Like Todd Helton put up years of a 162 WRC plus, a 163, a 166, a 160, a 141. They're they're all over. He played his entire career with one team, which is huge, and he had 55 career war. That goes back to uh, like the Arenado conversation with me when we were talking about should Arenado get paid, and everybody was like, "Well, I don't know. He's in. He's in. Uh, we, we can't do this. Colorado. Yeah. And right. it's like, well, he. But he was my argument the whole time. Was I actually really thought the Rocky? Well, they did. Well, I thought the Rockies were going to sign him, and they did. Um, I thought they were going to keep him in my mind. Like when I'm thinking about this, it's like, I'm not downplaying that statement, but what I'm going to tell you is if he signs a 10 year deal to stay at Colorado Rocky his whole life, who cares what he does in Colorado? He's going to be there. You can say that about Nolan. Now that he's in St. Louis, you can be like, Hey, I don't know. Let's get him out of Colorado and see Todd Helton never got out of Colorado. So that dude hit for his entire career, whether he had help or not, he couldn't make that like that wasn't his decision to make. Yeah. I don't know. It uh it it always bothered me when they held that against Nolan. So I feel like it's always gonna bother me when they hold it against Larry Walker, Todd Held, all those guys. You know, all those guys that played on those teams um that could really hit big cat, Andres Galarraga. Galarraga, right. Um so three man Hall of Fame class is Helton, Maurer, and Adrian Beltre. Beltre got in first ballot. Totally deserving. Yes. I love that two of those guys spent their entire career with one team. Yeah. Which bodes incredibly well for Joey Votto. Wow. Now. Not for me. Not for me. And I grew I I live in this area. I live in this area. Like I should be. Um, I think like Joey Votto is a fascinating case to me that's very similar to Johan Santana. Mm-hmm. That the peak was as good of a peak as you'll find, but it didn't last as long as you'd like. Right? Like, he was he was good at the end of that contract. 
He was good at the beginning of that contract, and he was really good in the middle. Right? Like, I just, I don't know if he did enough. Are, is he close to any milestones? Like, does he need to hit any milestones? Does he have any? Votto? Yeah. Because that's the other issue is, like, now we're getting so far into this that, like, you've got to have milestones. So, Votto, his last two years, dropped him below 300 as a career hitter. But he's got a career OBP of 409. Okay. He's got 356 homers. He's got over a thousand RBIs and he's got over 1300 walks. What's the war? Career war 65, 64.4. I mean, if you're giving Todd Helton at 55, then you have to give Joey Votto at 65. Uh, I was looking at F war. Let me look at B war for, for help. So he was at 55 F war in terms of B war. Helton is at 61.8. So Votto does have more career war than Helton. I don't know. I just, I really feel like. And in, and in terms of the accolades real quick, Helton, five all-stars, four silver sluggers, three gold gloves, and a batting title. Votto, an MVP, six all-stars, and a gold glove. The MVP helps, obviously. MVP helps a lot. Uh, I mean, that's it. That's it. Yeah, it's a huge. I, 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 a little bit of me thinks that like he's going to get the Michael Jordan effect where the end of his career is going to harm his image so much. Do people remember MJ in, in Washington? No, but you know what I'm saying? Like, that was always the fear. The fear was, hey, he's going to go to Charlotte. He's going to stink, which he did. Everybody's going to remember that, which nobody does. Nobody does. But, my point being, I do kind of think like when you think of Joey Votto as a baseball player, unless you're you and me and you like, you know, you're studying the game, you're really paying attention. These last couple of years have been tough for Joey. Yeah. Where did it start? The the suckiness for Votto? Yes. yes. 2022. Because 21... He had 36 homers. 250 with 36? Yeah. 266 with 36 and 99 driven in. So the only argument that you're going to hear now is that Cincinnati is a better place to hit than Colorado. <laughs> yeah. They're both band boxes. You know, I think it is actually pretty close. If you go look at the park adjustments. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think, really I think by home run factor, by home run park factor, Cincinnati, Cincinnati is an easier home run ballpark. Yeah, I think it is. I'll, I'll tell you right now. Um, but I, I do want to transition to Araldis Chapman because I th- I think it is a fascinating. Uh, I mean, it's another red. Why not? So by overall par- park factor, uh, Coors is the most hitter friendly ballpark. Then Fenway, then Great American. But by home run park factor, it's Great American by a landslide. And then it's Dodger Stadium, Yankee Stadium, the bank in Philly, Angel Stadium. Where is Colorado? Colorado's ninth in a home run park factor. Man, man, you gotta, you still gotta be able to hit. All right, Arold is uh, ten and a half. Uh, so he is now the highest paid Pittsburgh Pirate this year. We were paying the Pittsburgh Pirates. Um, I believe we're paying 26 players less than the Dodgers were paying Shohei prior to their oldest deal. Yeah, I could see that. I think it was sub 70 prior to the oldest Chapman deal. Man. (laughs) So Reynolds has an escalating contract. He'll get up to, I think 19 is the high point for him, but he's, he's pulling in 10 in 2024. You've got clearly a flip candidate in Chapman. Like, if if all things go right, Chapman's good, and you deal him at the deadline? You say that, and I don't disagree with you because I brought that up when we talked about it, but I waited, to, I waited to bring this up because I wanted to hear your reaction on live. But Bob Nutting coming out saying we're going to try to compete all year. Yeah, and Charrington said that. Like, if you're going to try to be in contention... I, and I'll be honest with you, man. Like, dude, 
A Roldis to Bednar, 8-9? It's, it's pretty good. good. Well, and you've got a Holderman and a Bajinski who was nasty this past year. There are options on the back end. And no if, Araldis, if Araldis goes through a stretch where he stinks, he went through a couple week stretch with Texas where he was he wasn't unusable, but he was not Spores or Leclerc. Right. They have options. They can go yes. Bednar in the ninth, working backwards, Holderman in the eighth, Majinski in the seventh, and, and Chapman can come in with multiple run advantages or disadvantages. Yep, they have options. The the arms are there. There's guys in the minor leagues. Um, yeah, I, I. It's a little interesting to me. Still, even even at even at that, um, I think it's interesting to me because like, that's the position that you choose to spend all this money on. Just seems odd, right? Mm-hmm. When you already have a closer. One. No, you're like, not the only one thinking that. I tweeted as soon as it happened. Over- I, I said you're 10 over, and a half with like four or question marks. You're over, you're overpaying and you're overpaying a setup. We, okay. Let me say this. We talked earlier about Adam Adovino and how the Adam Adovino market right now, it's about 6.75. I think that's what he turned down. It's probably close to what he's looking at because he's a setup guy. Adam, a Chapman is not going to close unless we don't, unless there's something that nobody else knows. Um, going on in Pittsburgh, but he's not going to close. He's going to make ten and a half million dollars not to throw the ninth. Yeah, I'm not sure there's been another guy in baseball that signed a deal with an AAV of over ten to not close. So, Robert I, Suarez, maybe Suarez, uh, Rafael Montero in Houston. Oh, yeah, we talked about him. We just talked about Montero. I mean, Kimbrel's making twelve this year. Is he going to close, or is it going to be Yenier yes. Cano? You think no, Kimbrel close. closes? Cano's got the eighth. Yes, that makes sense to me. I, I you know, we've talked about once again. Like I just, I, it doesn't take your best reliever to throw the ninth. It takes a certain individual to throw the ninth. I want my best reliever throwing in the most important point of the game, and I really don't think that's always the ninth. I just think that it's very difficult to get those three outs in the ninth, which is why it takes. So we, it's like it's like a leadoff hitter to me. Yeah. yeah, a leadoff hitter does it once a game, and we act like it's the biggest deal in the world. Those guys aren't any better hitters. They're no, they're they're good. They have a skill. They're good at at that, right? They they're really talented at that. Same thing with closers to me. Like you're a good pitcher, but I really you're just you're a little you're a little messed up in the head, and you're good enough to go get the last three outs. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. I uh, it's that that's always been fascinating to me. Do you think I, I I know Chapman? Like I know the splits. He was not as good in save situations as he was in setup situations last year, especially when he went over to Texas. I just I wonder if this is now the market for a guy that has been hot and cold over the last couple of years. And yeah, like he's always going to punch out fifteen guys per night, like always. Yeah, I mean the the forty two percent strikeout rate, and honestly, like the three two is probably a little elevated. Um, yeah, but, he had a three seven in Texas. I will say that. Yeah, I mean, and look, he's going to give up some home runs. That's what he's going to do. So, like, one of the stats that I really like, and I don't even know what it's called, but it makes a lot of sense to me, is there's a stat that um that that basically says. The percentage of opportunities that a reliever goes out there and doesn't give up a run relative to the percentage of opportunities that he goes out there and gives up a run. So the whole concept here is uh, the guy that I like to use as an example for this is Dylan Maples. Mm -hmm. Dylan Maples may end the year, end of the year, every year in AAA with a three, right? The thing was Dylan would go 10 outings in a row and give up not a base runner. And then he would go two outings where he would give up 10 earned runs. So if you look at that from the outside, not good. But if I go tell you that, hey, out of 12 outings in 10 of them, you're getting zeros, I'm taking that guy. Trying to find this stat that you're talking about. Yeah, I know. I know. It's a, here, let me see if I can find it. Um, I heard it and I just loved it. Like, Let's see. Yeah, I explained it very long too. 
uh, percentage of it. Let's see. Hmm. I don't know. I'll, I, we'll have to come back and I'll have to find yeah, that Yeah, I, I can't find that stat, but I do like that idea. It's, hey, amount of scoreless outings versus a amount of, you it know, just, outings yeah, where you allow like, a run or more. Right. Like, am I going out there? If you're a closer, and this is, okay, so this is perfect. If you're a closer and you have a two ERA, but you give up a run every other time you go out there or whatever, I guess that would, you you get what I'm you saying. You have a though. four and a half, Right. Uh, what I what you're saying is, if you have a two ERA, there are a couple of ways that you can get to that number. It's either across nine innings, you have seven scoreless outings, say an inning per outing to make math easy. You have seven scoreless outings, you have an outing of one run, and you have another outing of one run sprinkled in. Or you have eight scoreless outings, and you've got a two-run homer on your board. 100%. 100%. And I might tell you the interesting thing is I might tell you that like, so like the guy that gives up one twice, I might rather have that guy in the bullpen. Really? I'd rather have the two run Homer guy. I would for sure rather have the two run Homer guy closing the game. Yes. That's where I'm getting at. Cause if you lose, I you lose. That, but if you, yeah, put, like, if I put you I, in a position to win, you're going to win eight out of nine games. What you're telling me, you got to give me a zero. Like a closer's got to give me a zero more often than not. Yeah. Like I, I don't care if your stuff is lesser and I don't care if that means that once a month you were going to give up 30. And to be honest, that's kind of who Chapman is. It's either a zero or it's an onslaught. That's kind of my point is like, I, man, I, I don't hate that at the back end of a bullpen. You know, I, I yeah. I just don't. I think that especially for a team that uh, right now probably isn't going to score a ton of runs, like yeah. more than the rest of the league, you're, you know, run prevention is going to be extremely important. Having that eighth and ninth where you're not giving up one run is a big deal. The, the way that small market teams win a lot of games is by having a dominant bullpen. I agree. It's Kansas City. Kansas City. I, I, that is the gold standard when it comes to that approach. But think about the Tampa model and Kansas City, like I'll attach names to it. Like they were asking your Dono Ventura and James Shields to go six innings in the yep. World Series because then they would turn it over to Kelvin Herrera in the seventh, Wade Davis in the eighth, Greg Holland in the ninth. Game was over at that point. And, and, Health- if, and if, you got, if you couldn't get to the sixth, by the way, we had Luke Hoshaver. Exactly. Exactly. And it's former number one overall pick, right? Ho Chaver. Yeah. Who just yeah. didn't work out as a starter turned into a good reliever. The, the other good examples for me, 2021 Atlanta, the night shift, Matzik, Minter, Luke Jackson, Will Smith. I mean, those four, they, they gave you the back third of the game, but Tampa, I think is the best example. They strike between the margins. They've been doing it for the last 20 years. They've been doing it since Carl Crawford and Rocco Baldelli were in the lineup. They hit on a Kittredge, and they hit on a Nick Anderson, and they hit on a Diego Castillo and an Oliver Drake and a Chaz Rowe and a Colin Poche. Like, I I can keep going if you want me to. Pete Fairbanks, they find so many guys that can just shorten games for their starting pitchers. And there's a reason that they were the first one to go with the opener. The Pirates started doing the opener thing last year. I don't think they need to. They have so many mid-level starting pitching options, it seems. They've got a frontline guy in Keller. After that, you've got a bunch of threes and fours that you can run out. I think you just do that. But if you can shorten the game to six innings every night and you can turn to some assortment of Bednar, Chapman, Majinski, Holderman, Barucki, Moretta. That's six guys that I feel comfortable with in one inning spurts. Yeah, I mean, I, I they're not in a terrible spot. And I mean, I think if you if you even break down the the one area that I will say, go break down Kansas City a little bit more. And the big difference that Kansas City dominated while everybody else was kind of sleeping on it was they played the old school defense and pitching. Like that defensive team. They may not have been all gold glovers, but every one of them could really fly or they had a really good arm. They fit really well as a defensive piece in that puzzle. 
Um, and those were the two those were the two most important things uh, to that team was defense and pitching, which if you're not going to pay guys makes a lot of sense um, because that's where you can go get guys. When we look at Tampa, I think Tampa just trusts their process. They trust the guys that they want to go get. They go, hey, this is the this is the trait that we really like. We're going to exploit this, and we're going to put you in situations to succeed. Um, but I think, like, at the end of the day with Tampa, man, we can say all of this, dude, they just develop better than anybody in baseball. Yeah, they do. Flat out, there's no – I don't even think there's an argument. Well, and they they find weird shit. I think that's probably the best thing that they do. They find something that they want guys to do more of. And I think Robert Stevenson, hey, talking about the Pirates and Rays, Stevenson's an excellent example. How does that guy go from 10 Ks per nine to 15 and a half? Because right. he was doing something more in Tampa. They, It's not unlocked. It's emphasize what you already have and just do it. Matt Whistler turned in the best year of his life by throwing 90% slider, maybe 95% slider. I think it was, it was 91 or 92. 91. I faced him next year in spring training and it wasn't, I was like, man, this is going to be unbelievable. And like, no offense to him, but like, it wasn't crazy good. He just threw a bunch of them. They were good enough to get guys out. Yeah. And like, Hey, all you got to do is miss the bat three times. That's it, man. And like, look, like I said, it's, it's the, the, you, you look at guys that go get traded somewhere, go get, go to another team and a lot of times if it's a pitcher we're adding pitches or we're tweaking this we're tweaking that dude the rays are taking a pitch away they're telling you we want you to do what you're good at all the time and i'm going to make sure that you're in a position to do that i'm not going to put you in the game when you can't throw this pitch every single time yeah matt whistler i'm not putting you in the game against a guy that can hit right-handed sliders just not you're gonna if if you're gonna be in the game against a lefty that hits that crushes left right-handed sliders, I'm gonna take you out because I I don't want to I don't want to put you in a situation where you can't succeed, which is why they win so many trades too, right? Is like they get rid of these guys because not that they've been doing something special like you said, but they lead these guys into certain paths and to certain trends, and that doesn't always stick when they leave, right? Because we've developed these guys, and now you're with somebody else. I mean, man, I I am waiting on pins and needles to see what happens to Robert Stevenson. Three years, over $30 million with Anaheim. For a guy, for a guy that was supposed to be everything and more. This guy was Cincinnati. This guy they was chump him, change in Cincinnati, dude, in Colorado, and kind of in Pittsburgh, too. Dude, they, they gave him they gave him the world in Cincinnati to try to to try to figure it out, and he didn't. And now you're gonna give him thir- and, and so okay. So go back. The Angels are giving him $33 million and nobody can pay Hector Neris. Nobody can pay Neris and nobody's going to pay Adovino over one year? For six, seven, five, But you're going to give him $33 million because he's 30? The market's weird. Market's and Cody weird. Bellinger's sitting at home. <laughs> I just, I don't think it's apples to apples there. And I know, like, I know you're totally aware that it's not apples to apples there. It, it's just it's hard for me to think that Bellinger doesn't have any offers on the table or like Anaris doesn't have any offers on the table. They're just they're waiting. I don't see that. I, I think I, I do think that is one thing that now I haven't dealt with major league, but I my friends and stuff I've talked to. There's not very rarely, at least seemingly, do you get, you know, hey, I've got five offers at this, this or this. Right. Like very very rarely even a bad offer even is a, a team's going to be like hey we're just going to do no like a lot of times and you'll hear this from free agents like hey i got I, I didn't hear anything for two weeks and then i got six phone calls the same day <clears throat> oh that seems interesting doesn't it um but you know I, I do think that a lot of times people think that these guys are like man i just sign already like we know you Man, to the fans, most of the time, they don't. They don't have offers. These teams don't just throw these $200 million offers out there and let them slip. So you don't think Bellinger has an offer right now? I don't. If he has an offer, I think it was like a, hey, what do you think about this? Like, where are you at? If we offered you something around 200, are you good with that? Maybe a little bit more specific, but 
I don't think that Scott Boris has a piece of paper with a team's letterhead that Cody could sign today and be a member of a team. I don't think he has that. Interesting. Cool. That's I, something that I just, I wouldn't know. And I don't really think any baseball fan would know. I, I might be able to find out. Ooh, all right, go do that. Last thing quick, Joey Gallo, one year, $5 million to Washington. I love that value at five. I like the value at 10 last year in Minnesota. Wow, I, I disagree. Mean, well, here's, what I'll say. here's what I'll say. Washington did a nice job with Jamer Candelario last year. Uh, you were hoping to do that with uh, Dominique Smith, obviously. You didn't. Yep. Um, I think you're just doing it again, right? Let's get another piece. Flip At candidate. $5 million, I can buy a decent prospect if he has a good first first half. He's uh, – obviously, the OBP hasn't been there the last two years. Well, what about the batting average? 177? That was there? Yeah, well, 177 is not there. Like, it's it's never there, man. He was an all-star when he was hitting a buck 99. He hits homers, and he plays a good defense. And he walks. Yeah. yeah. That's I what mean, you're paying uh, for. It is he's, what you're paying for. He's frustrating. He's super, super frustrating. I totally get that. I but, think it's gotten more frustrating because I think that people expected the 27 homers to be 40. And if he hits 177 with 40 and a bunch of walks, you're looking at him more like a Kyle Schwarber, less like a Joey Gallo. So I think people looked at Gallo and may still be looking at Gallo because Gallo is sneaky 30 years old, only 30. People may be looking at Joey Gallo and saying, why can't you do what Schwarber was doing? The last three years, everybody's been begging for Gallo to be Schwarber with better defense. Okay, you might lead the league in strikeouts, but you also might lead the league in walks, and you might lead the league in homers. And he has two gold gloves to his name before he turned 30. No, it's really impressive in the field for a big guy. He's got a cannon. He uh, fascinates me. (sighs) Yeah, I, 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 so here's one thing I'll say. I played with a guy, and I'm not going to name him, but I played with a guy who was a bad base runner, but a really, really talented hitter out of high school and with power, but didn't use the power a ton. So team says, hey, because you can't really run well and you do have power, we want you to try to go for the power. He walked a lot. We want you to go for the power. We kind of want you to bang the walks. Well, the issue became that you figured out that that player based his at-bats around the walk, not in a bad way, but in a I can see some pitches way because I know at worst I can walk. I can – like Joey Votto, right? Think Joey Votto. Like he for sure took pitches in his career that he was like, wow, I really shouldn't have taken that pitch. Not a big deal, but I shouldn't have taken that pitch. So what I think happened when you told this player that was he forgot how to have an at-bat. Like, it was a totally new at-bat to him. So then he probably started chasing like crazy, and it just— And he starts punching out, and he stops hitting for average. And he he just spiraled, yeah. Right. So I don't mind that you didn't tell Joey Gallo to do that. I don't mind that. And I look, I (sighs) just— He's frustrating to me because I think that he is the face of new school baseball in a sense of in a bad way. When people talk about new school baseball, they go Joey Gallo and they point to him and it's like, well, this guy sucks. Like he hit 177, right? I don't feel that way. I think he's valuable. I think he adds value to a team. Uh, I just think it looks different and we're scared of different in this game i don't know that he adds more value than five my question is like i know this has turned into a long rant but like my question is is he can he ever be who they thought he was gonna be in the middle of the lineup bopper for a contender no because you're right he is only 30 but like does his can he be that good no never again I don't think so either. Like, I think, I think what you're like, I think what you looked at last year is what you're looking at. And like I said, I think that plays, I think there are for sure teams that use that. So I thought the Dodger trial was the best version of what that could look like. Yeah. He's on a good team. 
Give Joey Gallo's hitting eighth. He's, he's hitting a buck 80, but he's going to give us 30 homers if, he, if he's yep. in the lineup every day. You're okay with that as an eight hitter on a good team with a top flight rotation. With a top tier defense. With a top tier defense. My thing is, you know, like in Washington, he's not he's not asked to do too much because nobody's asked to do too much in Washington. They have low expectations. Right now, Washington has low expectations. But if he goes to a good team, I don't think this new version of Joey Gallo, or I guess like the lowered expectation of Joey Gallo is hey, we're going to go get this guy and he's going to be our five hitter and we've got World Series aspirations. I don't think that's what it is. I think he's a platoon DH. I think he's the best version of Vogelbach and Rowdy Telez we got. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, we could we could say that. I, I, and I can't, off the top of my head right now, I can't think, but I feel like there's another three true outcome hitter that I'm just not remembering right now. I mean, I guess Schwarber. Schwarber. Like, you know, I mean, like, but again, Schwarber's like Gallo, less- Gallo accumulates more war than Schwarber, even though Schwarber's galaxy's better offensively right now. Gallo, or even though Schwarber's galaxy's better offensively right now, Schwarber provide or Gallo provides enough defensive value to pass and walks, him in war. And he walks like crazy. He walks like crazy, but so does Schwarber. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like I said, I don't mind it, and and but. Let's go back to what I said about Kyle Schwarber. And I don't know Joey Gallo, but what I said about Kyle Schwarber was I think the only reason that, not the only, but I think a big reason that nobody questions what's going on in Philly with Kyle Schwarber is because he's such a good guy. Yeah. And he means so much to that clubhouse that he can, they can afford to let him be 190 with 40 and strike out 210, 210 times. Right. Not every guy can afford to do that. No. If Schwerber was a dick, is he still a Philly? Like, we don't know. No. No. He's not. He's not. Okay. There we go. He's not. All right. Uh, I'm going to run. I got to go watch Nikola Jokic play half a block away. As always, Taylor, very good time. And uh, we'll talk to you guys again soon. Sick.